Well, welcome to our webinar today on disruption in the auto sector. Forbes recently said this, that the auto industry is trying to prepare for disruption, but it's going too slow. Others have said there's nothing new about disruption in the auto sector. Uh, my grandfather started a little auto business with his cousins in West Virginia. You've never heard of it because it went out of business pretty quickly. These things do happen. But there's something different about right now, isn't there? Uh, COVID and trade uh, questions and so on. Um, so we're here to explore with some real experts what's really going on here. Now we're going to list five questions and each of our presenters are going to uh, give you a, a couple of minutes each about that. And then we invite you to send questions. Now this is a webinar, so uh, you cannot uh, uh, participate directly except by posting questions. Uh, or in the question box that you can find on your screen. So please do that and we'll reserve some time at the end to go over questions that you have. We'll also give you a way to connect individually with people after the webinar because we'll leave it open for 15 minutes uh, Eastern time from one to about 1.15. So with that, let's get started. Now here's our first question. What, what is going on? Uh, what disruption are we seeing? How are global auto sector uh, supply chains uh, changing? And I thought we'd start uh, with uh, Darren uh, Gifford. Darren, uh, I'll introduce the panelists one by one, but Darren is the uh, the head of the auto group yeah, at the great the accounting firm, uh, Plant Moran. And so Darren, uh, uh, what's going on? Well, thanks, Joe. Um, you know, it's a, um, this actually start, it's, this isn't new. The disruption was really uh, getting started, I think over the last couple of years, uh, just from some of the pressures occurring around trade and the, uh, the disagreements around trade that were occurring. Um, but I think it really accelerated with the COVID-19 crisis as well. So, and, in, and not even in March when it really hit the U.S., but uh, frankly, when it hit China in late January, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, we, we didn't feel it immediately because uh, it was the Chinese New Year, and so they had stocked up a bit in the pipeline. Uh, but the, uh, the the sensitivity to components and and parts coming from China over to uh, the factories in North America, uh, you know, clearly uh, was felt. And then uh, then the assembly side was completely disrupted in March as well. So now that we're starting to, to ramp back up, uh, we're also seeing the same problems with disruption now. This was where where do the parts come from? What is the volume? What levels are they running? Um, I was just actually in a conversation with uh, one of the OEMs, um, GM in this case, talking about the the difficulties with Mexico at this point as well, even within North America, and uh, the uh, the uncertainty about supply, and they're basically living week to week in many cases on where the components are coming from. So uh, we're in a very uh, vulnerable time on quote uh, any kind of stability in the supply chain, which is uh, probably a real opportunity for many suppliers. Thanks, thanks for kicking it off that way. And let me turn to uh, two uh, experts with us from East West Associates. Uh, that's our uh, major co-sponsor here with Frostbear and Todd today. Uh, and Marty, have you joined us, Marty Ross? No, okay. So we have two associates with uh, East-West Associates, Wayne Ifus. Uh, Wayne uh, worked his way uh, up the ranks of this uh, auto industry with Mitsubishi, uh, North America, and Denso. Spent a lot of time on flights back and forth to Japan, uh, covering really all the world uh, on these issues uh, for how things operate. So Wayne, let me turn to you, and then I'll uh, I'll ask Dan to speak after that. Wayne, what what is going on? Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, wow, what isn't going on right now? Um, it, it is challenging across the board, and as Darren has said, uh, you know there are challenges now that no one's ever faced before, at least recently. I, I guess in the automotive industry and the supply chain, probably the biggest disruption that happened uh, probably 2011. Uh, when the tsunami hit in Japan, there was a scramble for parts. There was a, a scramble uh, for the big tiers uh, and the manufacturers. Uh, at least at that time, there was a little bit of a step into, uh, you know, how do we handle some disruptions in a, in a supply chain? So there was new thinking. Uh, they stopped, they looked, they planned, they, they put strategies in place and implemented. Um, the biggest changes too, I think, uh, as well, uh, from a, a lower level, tier two, tier three, so forth, uh, on those supply chains. I think as well, uh, they there was more of a hands-off. You, you put your supplier in place, you set up your supply chain. 
it was on auto run, everything was good unless a quality thing popped up or something. Uh, but besides that, it was, you know, on its own, running its thing, not too much to worry about, low resources to take care of it. Now it's a whole different ball game. Uh, now is, is high visibility, know your data, know your suppliers, know what they're doing, know their suppliers, and the chain goes on and on. So, so those changes in itself, just the things that we used to do that were simplified and easygoing to now definitely more intense uh, with monitoring, reacting, changing, um, a whole new world. Thank you. Let's bring in Dan also from East West. Now, Dan spent 21 years, 21 years living in Asia and uh, 13 in China and seven in uh, uh, Singapore, which is one might call greater China, you know, and then even a year in the Philippines. And uh, so, you know, you've seen it, uh, you've lived there. So we're going to focus on the next question geographically, Dan. But uh, overall, what are we? What, what is changing, and what is the disruption in the supply chain? Well, I mean, there's most of the conversation, almost all of the conversation, is around component supply, which is truly critical in the industry. We talked about it, and, and Darren and Wayne have talked about that. But one of the things that we're seeing that that's um, really shocking and I, and I don't think is what certainly wasn't anticipated but the free flow of people has been disrupted so management staff can't get out of their jobs whether it's in china or in other parts of the world um uh, anecdotally uh, gm is struggling and running against roadblocks trying to get their management team back into china that they've essentially been shut out for six months um We've got a, uh, a company that we're doing some work with that is trying to finish up a factory and get it started up this summer, and they can't get the general manager back. They can't get the technicians back. Um, it's really uh, rather chaotic about whether they're going to be able to, you know, bring it up and online. And so this was really un unexpected. Um, also, on a personal note, I've got uh, some friends, a few friends. Uh, that run companies, Americans that run companies in China, they can't get back. They've been shut out for six months. They're, they're trying to run, you know, they haven't been able to operate their business. So this is a real, uh, a real wake up call on, it's not just a, an interconnected supplier component vehicle supply chain, but the free flow of people and technology has been totally disrupted. Really changing. Marty, uh, Ross, have you joined us? Marty, no, uh, he, he dropped off again. Okay, so you can get him back because uh, we'll have with us Martin Ross, who uh, uh, is with uh, Volkswagen North America. And, uh, be, well, we'll come back and give him a little more time when he rejoins. Well, let's go to the second question. Now we're going to look at Asia, basically. And maybe 10 years ago, we'd have said, well, let's look at China. But there's Thailand, and there are, you know, there are major uh, auto sector uh, players uh, throughout. Uh, we're going to look at East Asia right now rather than India, which is sort of a separate question. So what's really changing there? What are we seeing? Are we seeing uh, China disappearing? Are we seeing China Plus, where you, uh, you change your supply chain in East Asia? Um, uh, but before I go to that, I'm sorry, I overlooked my good colleague, Jan De Beer. Jan, let me start out. Lawyers often get overlooked, and this time it's my fault. So Jan, what are, you, what are you seeing overall? And then I'll tee it up for Dan to start on the next question. But Jan, what's the, what's the big scene you see in the disruption in the auto sector? Thanks, Joe. No, um, really from, from, the, from the legal perspective, obviously COVID-19 from the business perspective has exacerbated the supply chain disruptions. But really in my international trade practice, I really started seeing mass shifts, especially in the trade front in 2018, um, with regards to the Section 301 tariffs that were instituted at that time. Um, you know, uh, D D Dan's already mentioned that the, 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 the reliance of components, so many of those components are actually manufactured in China. So for the first time, that 25% or 15% tariff that was being applied to those items are really starting to affect the bottom line. So at that stage with exclusion filings, a number of companies started recognizing that it's something that they would have to consider. Um, the USMCA has also affected that. I think there was a pretty clear understanding from most of my, my clients just because of the business dynamics and the political dynamics at issue that the USMCA was likely to be ratified in some shape or form. Um, 
and 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 given the requirements of the agreement, as we'll discuss later in 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 in, in, in the seminar, um, also required some pretty hard rethinking of established supply chain networks. So all that was changing in 2018, 2019, and obviously now with COVID-19, these disruptions have been exacerbated even further with a number of ancillary factors. So from a legal perspective, as I said, this is a this is what I would call a and I hate the epidemiological uh, reference, but it's been a slow curve with a rapid escalation here. I think within the last couple of months. And that uh, it's Jan De Beer, the head of our international trade practice at Prosper and Todd Willett. Uh, Marty Ross may join us. I hope so. I think he's having technical difficulties. But let's go on to the second question. Dan, we'll start with you. When, when you look at, at East Asia, uh, how is the supply ch uh, chain changing? Okay. Um, Ch you know, China is the largest auto market in the world. Uh, so we'll continue to see, you know, that's going to continue to be a very significant market and very, very critical to U.S. manufacturers and suppliers. They're also, so you know, they're just so established as a, as a supply network now, uh, sort of a one-stop shop for components that they're not going to get away from that. And, and they're still going to have a domestic, huge domestic and growing domestic demand. So they continue to be a, a big player. But there has been a move uh, to diversify outside of China for manufacturers. Now, this started in the general industry 10 years ago. As labor costs started to increase, the labor supply is decreasing. May not, many people may not be aware, but this, essentially the labor supply peaked in China about six or seven years ago and has been declining. So they're going to continue to provide a move upward pressure. So manufacturers started moving out uh, 10 years or so ago. Um, and, and over time, uh, you know, labor costs, lack of uh, movement on IP protection, regulatory pre uh, pressures, more sophisticated domestic competitors have made it harder and harder to do business uh, in China. So people look to left to leave. Um, and at the same time, Southeast Asian industry uh, countries were uh, really trying to court them. And they could do it a little bit under the radar because, you know, a drop in the bucket um, uh, from from China, moving out of China would be a flood into these smaller economies. Thailand has the most established and most sophisticated automotive supply base, so they've been a certainly been a beneficiary. Um, they've got a good parts sector. They're the largest uh, um, manufacturer in, in uh, Southeast Asia, and a lot of companies have begin to look at that as a, a an option to China, and in addition to China. And you, in addition, you, not to lower cost and established manufacturing, we get access to a 600 million person market in Southeast Asia that's, that's growing. So we're definitely seeing more interest moving to Southeast Asia. First movements to, Th to Thailand, although we're starting to see because of government incentives and, and promotions, uh, Philippines and Vietnam is being significant. But it's definitely a plus one situation. It's in addition to China, not, not an elimination of China. Thank you, Dan. I'll turn to the others, but Marty, join it. Can you hear us and uh, participate? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Thanks for uh, being Welcome. patient with me. I had some uh, technical challenges here, and uh, anyway, I think I got it sorted out now. So sorry, you I'm a few do minutes indeed. Ahead. So right. let me introduce you and bring you in on the first topic, which uh, the others sure. have commented on. Uh, Martin Ross is the senior manager, of North American purchasing for VW Group of America Inc. So he is on the hot seat here on figuring out <laughs> what to do with the supply chain sure. and. And so let yeah. me start, Marty, by asking you, what, what are you seeing? Uh, what, what are the challenges to somebody like you? Boy, uh, yeah, I, I caught the very uh, first part of the introduction uh, a few minutes ago, too, and, and you hit the nail on the head. There's a lot of different challenges. And, and, and not only, uh, you know, what we're experiencing right now related to COVID-19, obviously that had a huge disruption to everyone's operations, uh, suppliers and OEs alike. Um, but, uh, you know, also a big part of what we're working on now is all the trade uh, topics, right? So, um, you know, uh, with uh, with COVID-19, maybe starting there, you know, we had to uh, obviously look inside our own factory first to, to see what sort of safety requirements we needed to, to put in place, uh, make sure we have very clear policies for everyone to, uh, to follow, uh, but also communication was key, right? Uh, that we had to let everyone know what was going on in the time that we were closed. Um, we held uh, basically weekly meetings with our supply base by Skype. 
uh, just to kind of keep everyone informed of here. Here's what's happening at our factories and uh, here's what we're seeing elsewhere in the region and uh, try to let them know what we're seeing from a, I'll say from a policy standpoint, state by state, uh, but also, uh, you know, what we're seeing in, in terms of, um, you know, sales requirements, right? So meanwhile, people are still buying cars. So we, we started to see a depletion of inventory in the, in the pipeline. So, uh, but yeah, now that we're back up and running, obviously we had kind of the mismatch of timing between the timing where the states and the U.S. were ready to come back up, and um, and then uh, likewise the uh, on the other side of the thing is in, uh, in Mexico, many of the states were still shut down and are still in a position right now where uh, they're very slowly ramping up. So every day we're still watching what the supply chain looks like what's the availability of parts what's the availability of manpower and uh so it's a, it's really a, a big challenge right now for sure and if i may take you to the second question china i think vw maybe is the most successful historically uh, uh, in china certainly a lot of uh -huh. i remember being there many times and you take sure. a taxi cab you're in a vw and so you're a very global <laughs> company but very successful yeah. When you look at East Asia and supplying what you need to supply here in the States, are you, are you doing a little bit what Dan talked about, which is some diversification within Asia, or do you kind of, mm -hmm. how do you think about it? Uh, it's, it's a fantastic question. Um, obviously, the, the trade situation with China right now is a little bit tricky with the tariffs that are in place. Um, those have had an effect on our suppliers, but also us directly. Um, and uh, in, in some cases, you know, we've, we've had to kind of seek out some alternatives, uh, but not in every case. Um, so what we're trying to do right now is kind of enlist the support of our suppliers to say, okay, how, how does your supply chain look? Um, if we see new tariffs coming along, what, what is your plan? How do we adapt to that? um we don't see them going away in the short term right so uh for that reason we need to make sure we at least have it clear of what uh what impact they could have on our business but also suppliers business because not in every case uh it's not every case that the oe is directing that supply to china it could be that the suppliers are directing their own raw material supply chains and uh, therefore they may be on the hook to, to cover some costs that they had been anticipating either so um you know we're asking hey please understand your supply chain if there is uh, a risk for you know tariffs or some other kind of trade barrier, you need to understand that. And if you need to try to find an alternative and work, we'll work with you to, to sort out what that alternative means in terms of you know, uh, releasing that material for production or engineering changes or whatever the case may be. But um, you know, we may not necessarily have visibility to all those little factors in the supply chain that go down to the tier three, tier four level. So for, uh, for that reason, we really rely on our suppliers to come with some ideas on, on how to, to mitigate that risk. Thank you. Let me turn to you, Jan, uh, from a legal standpoint. I mean, your, your team is immersed in the battles over uh, exceptions and so on and so forth. What have you seen as to Asia? Are you seeing more imports uh, from other places uh, continue? How do you, uh, you know, when, when clients are dealing with uh, East Asia, um, what's your uh, advice to them? Yeah, Joe, what we've really seen here, obviously, and I think as a panelist pre previously said, the problem with trying to do your China plus one strategy is given the nature of modern manufacturing, that so many of the items we manufacture are so technologically complicated, and that entire segments of the supply chain are very regional. Um, you know, you, you, you know, for instance, tooling manufacturers can be Japanese or or, or German. Um, you know, uh, raw material suppliers can be very dependent on China or maybe India. So your ability to re take entire segments of a of, of of a supply chain and simply move it to a different country is is, is something that's virtually impossible to do, um, both from a from a business and a geopolitical perspective. Um, what we have seen, obviously, in fighting with the tariff exclusions, tariff requests, is that clients understand and, and put a lot of vestige and a lot of interest in those filings. But at the end of the day, uh, the process, I think, has been somewhat less than desirable um, and, and remains that way. Um, I think that in the, what I've been seeing is that clients have made that they're not shifting their 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 basis completely from China. They are paying the tariff. Uh, hoping that politically maybe there can be a, a, a deal with China that would somehow uh, move away those tariffs in, in the near term. 
unfortunately, COVID seems to have thrown that all you know, up, up, upside down. You know, at the beginning of the year, I was telling my clients with the phase one trade deal that was signed by Trump um, that, hey, look, you know, one can see the winds of change that maybe there could be. It seems politically favorable for both sides. We're taking a huge hit from this thing to go ahead and make a deal. The problem now with COVID-19 is it has gone 180 degrees from that, and 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 this trade war, in my perception at least, looks to be reality in the in, in, for the for the foreseeable future. Um, so, whether or not companies get will still be willing to pay the 25% tariff in the next uh, over the next few months, next few years, and are really going to try and move most of the operations to Vietnam. I see Vietnam as a hot candidate, young workforce, lots of economic uh, uh, cap uh, opportunity. Thailand is another name that gets mentioned quite a bit. Um, but as I said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky to do. And can't be done overnight. And how about you, uh, Darren, uh, your clients, you work with them closely on these uh, issues, increase in tariffs and so on and so forth. What, what are you seeing as East Asia? Um, well, it, it is, uh, I, I would, uh, Reiterate everything that uh, Marty and Jan and others have said. Um, the uh, it's it's the challenge is trying to figure out what now not only the economic aspect, right? So if it's a 25% increase, um, but it's a total cost aspect as well. So what's you know what is the cost of the production of the unit if it's in China or Thailand or Vietnam uh, with a lower labor cost um, with more automation that starts to reduce down as well as far as the potential benefit. Uh, but then it's not only the the transportation to get here, it's the uh, the pipeline uh, for the you know the month of travel on the, on the ocean to get here because you surely don't want, don't want to do it on a plane, um, and uh, and then you know and then the the stocking levels that have to be here. So uh, there's a, a risk factor around the the lengthy supply chain that I think is going to become uh, you know, more the decision in the decision process uh, in the in the near term. So so a source like a Mexico sometimes is better from that standpoint. Um, a little disruptive if you're in Puebla, Marty, right? So. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, little. It's, uh, but there's, you know, Mexico will eventually come out of this. Um, I think that drives a lot of short-term decisions, thinking uh, about that as well as uh, you know, like putting production back in the U.S., which is really where the Trump administration is trying to push, uh, you know, the the our industrialists to, to start thinking more about that. Of course, um, the challenge I think longer term, though, just to throw a different perspective in here, um, as well as that the the OEM architectures over the longer term are evolving on a regional basis to be very different. Um, China uh, and Europe will, will clearly be leading the way on electric vehicles at this point. Uh, the, the U.S. is going to be lagging pretty far behind. Maybe a lot more hybrids here, uh, but um, you know, especially with the the government, um, the regulatory processes, uh, we're clearly backing away from some of the emissions reductions. And you know, the OEM architectures lead directly into what kind of components do we need, what kind of things need to be built here. And so, uh, you know, the the whole idea of of uh, connecting rods in China uh, start to decline quite rapidly. Uh, when you go to an EV environment, you don't need those for for an internal combustion for a, a battery powered vehicle. Um, and you know, and in the U.S., then you know, the connecting rod business may be very good for a while. Uh, maybe the, the engines are getting smaller. So uh, I think the other part about the supply chain is going to be that evolution on the vehicle architectures leading in directly into what kind of parts get made in which part of the of the world, and uh, you know, and how efficiently can you make it in those different parts of the world. And and so I think that's going to lead to some other decisions around supply chain in the longer term that's going to are going to be very impactful on the supply base. Well, Darren, let me stay with you as we go to the next question, and that has to do with North America. Uh, NAFTA is gone. The USMCA, here we come. And uh, yeah, let's let, let's look at North America. What are we seeing? As you've said, the administration, the current administration, is is saying make everything in America. There we go. And now we have USMCA, where 75 percent eventually of the uh, co content has to be North American versus 62 and a half percent and so on and so forth. And then we see Mexico and the challenge that it's been cut down longer than the U.S. Uh, companies. Now, maybe we haven't had to make as many flights lately, but this is an issue. So what do you what do you say to people? Should you make everything in the U.S. or business as usual or something in between? What do you see for North America? Well, it's interesting. Just the acronym is interesting. So we always forget about the C in there. So. And uh, that's unfortunate for the Canadians, right? Uh, but that probably isn't a major focus for a lot of, a lot of the the uh, production work. And that's a and that's a challenge in Canada because their cost structures are out of whack, right? Um, so the focus is always on the M and, and on the U part in there. And so uh, I think it, it will lead to some pretty radical changes. Um, you know, it's interesting because um, we've decided to move ahead on July 1. So next Wednesday, we will be in USMCA, whether we realize it or not. <laughs> 
Uh, no one is ready from a documentation standpoint. The forms aren't even, you know, there's no official forms out there to actually go fill out to try and you know, trace content. Um, so it will be, uh, it'll be a mess for a number of months. Uh, it could be for, for a couple of years, I think. Um, but eventually it will all kind of catch up and we're going to have to meet the requirements that are in USMCA, which eventually are going to be 75% content uh, here. And that will drive, that needs to drive some production decisions and some uh, investments that are going into production, not only in Mexico, but I think in the U.S. as well. Uh, and one of the things that we, we think that uh, we, we tell all of our, our clients on the supplier side uh, is that you really need to think about uh, multiple scenarios. I and mean, how is this going to play out? How does it fit your production supply chain and your production plants? Uh, and that visibility that Wayne was talking about earlier, as far as looking down into the supply base to see. You know, you, you know, your supplier may be great and he's down the street, but if he's buying 90 percent of his content from China, uh, you know, then, then then there's an issue there. Right. So that's not going to work. So uh, so really looking at the whole supply chain and and you, and unfortunately, um, I won't call it trust, but just, you know, you, you can't have that visibility only to that next tier of supplier down. You've got to look beyond that to the next several tiers to really know what's occurring down there. Uh, and then, then you can use that to try and try and build uh, what we would call some different scenarios and sensitivity around. Okay, what are the real cost factors and drivers? And um, and many times, what's happening is that our our clients are actually splitting their production. I would say they're not sole sourcing to a country now. They're trying to figure out, you know, how do I keep? And it's it's more expensive on tooling, of course. But how do I keep production available in both sites? Because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So uh, it's kind of a strange, crazy world we're trying to put a stable supply chain into. Well, Marty, let me let me ask you. I mean, VW has a big presence in Mexico, and uh, I'm sure you have something going on in Canada as well. But when you look at North America, and you're in charge of purchasing for it, I, is it kind of business as usual with some tweaks, or is there more going on? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, as Darren mentioned, it's um, it, the new rules are quite complicated. You know, so we we have to hit a number of um, different. Um, you know, measurements to be in compliance for all of our vehicles in North America. And that's our goal is to have all the products that we produce in North America comply with USMCA. Um, you know, that being said, uh, specifically our factory in Mexico, they uh, produce cars not only for North America, but for Europe. Uh, so they have, a, let's say, a more global supply chain than even we do here in Chattanooga in the U.S. Um, so the, the real challenge is to... Um, yeah, obviously maintain competitiveness and profitability and be investment smart and uh, still hit all those different um, uh, measurements that, that USMCA requires. So um, it, it is quite tricky. So we're, we're having a mix of um, in, uh, smart investments. And uh, uh, as uh, we were just discussing electrification here in the U.S., so part of that's coming to the U.S. Uh, here in Chattanooga, we're going to produce electric vehicles here in 2022. Uh, so that's, you know, was already kind of in the pipeline, but is really helping us to, um, let's say, get over the, the hump a little bit in terms of a compliance with USMCA. Likewise, for our uh, internal combustion engines, we're, we're also doing some investments on, on those cars as well. Um, so, uh, but to get, as Darren just mentioned, it's going to take a couple of years for everybody to come into compliance with um with USMCA, not only because of the regional value content requirements, but also we have to think about the labor value content requirement, which is a specifically a challenge for companies located in Mexico and uh, and also North American steel. So, um, you know, you're, you're with the steel topic, you're playing uh, the game of, you know, what what's the pricing price point I can get in the United States or, or North America with steel versus the price I might pay of European steel, but oh, by the way, you, you may need to pay a tariff on that. Um, so we're kind of watching all those different dynamics and how the, the North American steel industry maybe increases their capacity over time. What will the steel industry look like in Mexico over time? Will that develop any further than the way it is today? So um, yeah, we're, we're trying to trying to look down the road a little bit to see, see how it's all gonna come together, but so far we have a good plan to come into compliance with everything, but it's, it is quite complicated for sure. Well, Jan, let me turn to you, and then Wayne, I'll probably bring you in. Um, uh, Jan, I think there was news from the U.S. Supreme Court about the steel tariffs yesterday. You might want to touch on that. And also, uh, what do you tell clients when there are no forms to fill out? <laughs> you know, how, do, how, do, how do you deal with the, the changeover from NAFTA to, to USMCA? Your thoughts, please. 
Joe, at least this week, have already helped half a dozen clients generate and create their own forms that meet the necessary criteria. So this is where you got to go. You got to create stuff on the fly. Really, that's really what it boils down to. It really requires some ingenuity. Uh, it really requires, I think, an intent on uh, regulatory at least to do your best. Understanding, I think, as Marty and Darren really do, that the rules are even for a lawyer are 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 uh, you know it's 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 intimidating. Um, you know, I think from the, you know, obviously the of Supreme Court, the ruling yesterday has shown that they have no interest in uh, interceding uh, with regard to the Trump administration's, um, what I would say, aggressive use of uh, national security interests uh, for economic purposes. Um, so that and, 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 the steel tariffs and the aluminum yeah, tariffs? And they've, 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 you know, they've just not, they've, they're not going to hear the case. Um, so what it really boils down to is that, um, and even that creates its own complexities. I mean, even though you say, for instance, that Mexico, Canada could be excluded from these 232 tariffs, um, I'm already hearing from some clients that are really concerned that some Canadian aluminum, aluminum is going to be coming back in under the framework of, 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 of these tariffs. So even though you have the USMCA and you have what you think are the rules, you know, overnight, those rules can change. So, you know, as I said, what is the USMCA helping or hurting anything? I, what I think is really happening is it's just the law of the land. It, it's, it's just reality moving forward. Um, I do think the, the the factor from a regulatory perspective as an attorney that I really, really think supply chain managers are going to have tr trouble with moving forward, and Marty would know better than I, is that is that $16 an hour labor content, how you're even going to track that and, and trace that throughout your system is a daunting prospect that I'm glad that it's somebody else's pay job, but that is going to be the one that I think is going to be really difficult to track because that's something that really has never been considered before from my perspective, uh, from a supply chain uh, supply chain perspective. First time the minimum wage entered a trade agreement, as far as you know. <laughs> Honestly, okay, well, yeah. Me, yeah, well, let me turn to you, uh, Wayne. I mean, you dealt for many years. Uh, uh, for on behalf of Japanese uh, OEMs or, or tier ones, and uh, you know, part of it is that uh, some uh, uh, significant part of the the value, the the, value, the total content of a, an automobile made uh, here in the United States is is Japanese, and now it moves from 62 and a half to 75. But I think it's still true that the most value content made in North America is probably still a Japanese automaker. So. So you know, how does this affect uh, you know Japanese, European, uh, even Chinese now that owns Volvo? Uh, how does it affect all all these things for North America now? Yeah, really dynamic, really uh, really intense, and and everyone's bringing up some really great points uh, about the. I guess it's almost a double-edged sword, at least what we can see so far with the new uh, implemented uh, USMCA. So yeah, there's no question. NAFTA was over 25 years old. I mean, it was old, and 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 you know, it's still following things that digital uh, wasn't even that complex yet uh, in some of the trades and so forth, uh, and they weren't addressed. So it, yes, it was needed that a, a new trade agreement is definitely a plus. The things that were so unsure and 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 so uh, a little bit scary. Uh, I mean, we uh, essentially they just released basically uh, the details. Uh, of the new new agreement just a few weeks ago. So there is at least a relief that uh, I think there were things that were they're going in, in in the industry or rumors or or talk about how challenging and difficult it actually will be. Uh, now that the details have come out, it's a little bit better. They can understand it. Now we know what we need to do and strategize, you know, how we're going to implement and make the changes necessary. Uh, uh, as far as the manufacturer, you're right. Th these are huge, uh, you know, going from 62.5 to 75%. Um, I, I guess we should be, in a way, or at least the manufacturers should be happy that it, it didn't happen with what they were actually proposing at the beginning at 85%. Uh, so at least they did make it down to 75. Uh, the content itself for all the suppliers, same thing. Traceability that Jan had mentioned is huge. How is all that traced? And, and as others had mentioned too, about uh, a labor rate or labor costs involved uh, and the labor uh, content within the vehicles uh, also is an interesting spin uh, and a challenge as well. And what will that do in force? Now I know some of them had already in the panel discussed about how much uh, will return to the states and, and will it? Um, it? I would agree that some would come back, but at to what level? And even some are thinking to get away uh, around this labor rate or whatever. You, I think we may see some more 
implementation of automation and robotics even more so, um, more so. That to, to eliminate some of that as well. So that could be a, a major factor. Thanks. Well, let's go on to our next one. And by the way, for the attendees, you can start using the chat box to post any questions you have for the panel. We'll get to those uh, before we wound uh, wind up in about 20 some minutes. Uh, so the fourth question is this, what are the smartest moves that you all are seeing uh, by OEMs and suppliers? Uh, what's what, what are the smartest strategies being implemented uh, amidst this uncertainty and this this disruption? Uh, I don't know. Let's let's start with you, Jan. Uh, what, what have you found? What uh, name a couple that come to mind? Yeah, Joe. Really, you know, in, in the legal framework, it's not really my position to call what's good and what's bad. I mean, that's really more for the business guys. What I will say is that has come clear to come very clear to me in in dealing with these matters is that. Um, Companies that are based or suppliers that are based in the United States have suddenly become very, very valuable and have had uh, probably have increased leverage with regard to negotiating of cost and provisions that they didn't have necessarily even a couple of months ago, um, both because of location um, and but also because of, 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 the U, of the USMCA requirements. So what I have seen is that I do believe that local suppliers, parts being produced locally, are 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 a bit of a unicorn, and 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 have been able to leverage themselves successfully to try and get the best possible deal they could from an OEM. Very good, Darren. What uh, what smart strategies have you seen amidst this uh, situation? Um, well, you, you know, it's this may be a kind of a simplified view of uh, for you of it, but frankly, um, the thing that we've seen that's been probably most effective, which is like I said, simple, is is over communication, frankly. Um, you know, so yeah, I think it's important, um, to, as I mentioned earlier, to understand that and have that visibility uh, and, and really building up um, your supplier pipeline from a bill of material standpoint down through the tiers. But then uh, the communication down from not only to your supplier, but then figuring out how do you get it down to the other tiers uh, has been something we've seen a number of companies endeavor. And they've been, it's been very effective for them because uh, then they find out very quickly if there's going to be issues or not. Uh, it's it's a it's a uh, it's time consuming. It's difficult, um, and there's always lots of questions that you always have answers to. But uh, that whole idea of of, of that communication uh, and communicating really early uh, is has been very important in this restart process since we come back up in production as well. And um, and it's important from the suppliers, I think, too, because they're they're all trying to figure out if they believe you or not, right? If, if you're the customer, and and they're trying to figure out where they should put their investment of, of not only uh, time and, and people, but also the, the money as well as if they want to tool up again. And that leads to some of the automation uh, aspects that Jan talked about as well, which I think the other part is that, the, you know, there is going to be a push toward trying to figure out um, and, and finding the, the capital, the real return on automating a lot more of the factories as well, and not just kind of running the same old equipment, because there's a lot of old equipment out there. And so uh, I think there is a potential for, for seeing some retooling. And so mm -hmm. those are all different factors playing into how do you, you know, you know, change the supply chain out here. But it really, the communication factor is the only place you're going to learn a lot more about it. Yeah, and if you want to watch the Academy Award-winning documentary of the, this year, it's called An American Factory, about how a Chinese company came to Dayton, Ohio, and the the ending of it is all about automation. It's not about China-U.S. stuff. But uh, but anyway, Marty, let me turn to you. You you talked about communication already. And that's certainly smarter than ever, I would think. But what what are you seeing as the smart strategies that maybe you've employed or that you've seen other OEMs employ that would be helpful to the audience? Yeah, I, I think a lot of what uh, was already said, you know, what we're uh, in the process right now of planning is kind of a kickoff meeting for our supply base, right? So, um, and the, the goal there is to take all the suppliers that currently have business with us in North America, whether that's for Volkswagen or even for Audi, uh, as well as newly nominated suppliers and go through the rules with them uh, to the best of our knowledge and also provide some resources for the suppliers to uh, research more about uh, the rules of origin, uh, but also try to make it very clear what our expectation is uh, from, from our supply base. And that is, first of all, help us to understand your whole supply chain. The rules are different. Um, and we're going to be asking you for a whole lot of data that goes to our customs department, uh, not necessarily to the purchasing folks, but to the customs uh, team, uh, so that they can start to build up, um, you know, what the local content uh, really looks like in each of our vehicles. 
together with that, then uh, the, the topic of labor comes up, right? And uh, this is an OEM requirement, right? So it's, it's uh, not necessarily a supplier requirement. It's on the, the OEM to, to prove to uh, the governments that, hey, we're, we are in compliance here with, with labor. Uh, and so for that, we are a little bit in the process right now of trying to develop exactly how we're going to track that. Um, you know, whether it's based on Bureau of Labor and Statistics data, whether it's based on some kind of self-certification from the supplier uh, that they do meet that, um, because we also don't want to get into a position where uh, we're asking the supplier to divulge too much about their, uh, let's say their competitive edge, right? Um, we don't wanna uh, breach that as much as possible. So um, that's our plan right now is to, to, let's say, do kind of a big shotgun approach at first to try to get as much information out there, but then also try to collect as much information as we can as quickly as, quickly as we can. Because we know that even though uh, entering the force is already next week, we'll have more or less until the end of the year and potentially until the end of our fiscal year uh, to uh, compile that data and, and have some evidence that, that we're in compliance. So that's that's kind of our communication path that we want to take, um, you know, to put ourselves in a position to, yeah, really have a clear idea where we're really at. Excellent. Dan, mm -hmm. what, have you, or what, what advice do you have on this one? What are the smart strategies? Pick one or two that would help the audience. Well, Okay. Um, well, one of the things we've talked to a few companies over the last few months um, about the doom and gloom, but I've asked them specifically: Have you seen any silver linings? Have you seen anything uh, positive to come out of the what's happened, the disruption the last couple of three months, you know, where you know, people can't go to their offices and social distancing requirements? Are, but it's really forced companies to rethink and re-engineer a lot of their business processes and the way they do things, uh, being able to adopt more digitization on, on workflow, be able to uh, manage remote work. And it's, it, I think it's senior people in some of these companies are thinking, hey, you know, we've got, we've overcome some inertia. There's opportunities there. Uh, before it was, sort everything was sort of static and we had fallen into a routine and this forced the way to rethink the way to do things. And so um, and they're seeing this as an opportunity. It, it, where in their mind, in, in many cases, the cost of IT or information technology was thought as a cost of doing business, as a tool for cost. And it's starting to shift to be thought of more of a, a value creator. And uh, I think it's taken a crisis like this the last few months to sort of shake people out of that their old mindset. Very good, Wayne, your thoughts Very on good. this one? Wayne, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, er everything so far is exactly spot on, I think as a smart move, uh, going forward, um, what I've also seen the negotiations uh, with a lot of their suppliers. Where are you at? Can we renegotiate? Because costs are going to change. I mean, there's no question how much they're going to change across the board with labor, with content, and so forth. So uh, with with uh, aluminum and steel. Uh, so they're so, so they're collaborating now is a smart move uh, to get in front of that. Um, the other things I also seen that that. As Marty had mentioned too, building databases and, and building uh, some kind of tracking. Um, earlier I had mentioned about uh, pretty much the last real automotive uh, issue that happened in 2011 uh, with the uh, tsunami in Japan. Uh, from that, uh, a silver lining, like Dan said, uh, found a new way to implement some tracking and a database. If I'm not mistaken, they had at the time about 650,000 suppliers that they now wanted to track and see where they're at. Where, what do they have going on? What are the issues? What are the possibilities and risks? So risk management. So, so the folks that are doing that, uh, assessing where they're at, uh, implementing some kind of risk management or assessment, I think is key to the whole thing and their survival in the future as well. Okay, well, thank you. Let's go to the last one, which is kind of tips. Uh, we've already gotten in tips for the uh, OEMs and the and the various tiers, the suppliers, uh, and what trends you see uh, developing. So I'll just go around the horn on on this, uh, starting with you, Darren. What's your top tip or two? Okay, um, some of this we probably talked about, but I'd, I'd say uh, that idea of 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 really understanding that I call the total economic value of that uh, supply chain is probably uh, number one, uh, just from a, a financial standpoint, because I think there's been a tendency to to go to uh, 
the um, the the LCC, the low cost country, and then not fully understand what the implications are in your supply chain. Uh, in fact, we had some clients. It was interesting that um, you know simple projects, really, just like you know, like looking at just packaging within the sh within, the, within the shipping containers, right? Uh, that they hadn't really optimized or thought about, so it didn't reduce transportation cost. Uh, but then looking at what that what's the impact, what's the implication on that leads into the next one, which is on you know what are the real scenarios for cost reduction as well. So is it a local production plant? Is it Mexico? Um, should you move from China to Thailand or to, to Vietnam or, you know, and what, what are the implications? Now, the challenge with doing that is you really have to have uh, that better visibility because one, you know, you can't just pick up that supplier, move it to another location, expect that all the other suppliers to that supplier kind of go with it, right? So now you've got a whole process of, you know, are they reliable or not? I mean, you can't, there's no, uh, I said, you, you, it's not a, a trusting environment that you can guys blindly kind of say, yep, it's going to come off here and, you're going to get the part that's going to fit on your, your car going down the line in Chattanooga, right, Marty? Because if it doesn't fit right, you got a problem. <laughs> um, but then that's where I think the transparency and the communication and um, that the whole supplier relationship aspect is absolutely critical. Uh, and, and we do a, a study every year, uh, and we're talking with, uh, with uh, and we had uh, the, the uh, discussions with a number of the OEMs around that, around OEM and supplier relationships, but now it's also evolving into supplier to supplier relationships. And that level of transparency is not really something that has that been very well established in uh, most organizations at this point. I think that the, the Toyota Koretsu probably has an advantage to some degree uh, on some of that kind of visibility, but there's still never been that open uh, line of communication and uh, even open line of sharing on costs, as Marty talked about. Uh, we're going to have to get over that if we're going to really be a lot more efficient and effective on, on how the supply chain is going to work in the future. So um, those are those are... Yeah, those are practical tips, maybe a little more, not so simplified, but I think if you don't do those those three things, uh, it's going to be really hard to, to change the way you operate. Marty, let me turn to you and maybe here, I'll maybe rephrase the question for you. What tips do you have to your suppliers that makes them, would make them stand out in, in this uncertainty? You say, boy, I'm going to stay with that supplier versus having a lot of questions about somebody. What, are, what tips uh, do you have? You know, I, I personally always appreciate when uh, a supplier might be faced with an issue like that, that they they come with some kind of solution or some kind of proposal. Um, you know, we obviously don't know everything about their supply chain and we don't know all the challenges they're, that they're facing, uh, but it makes our life a lot easier if, um, you know, if, if there's already some kind of idea or some solution, on it, here's how we can deal with it usually we can adapt, right? Um, and, uh, you know, whether it's, hey, I've got a manpower problem or I've got an issue with the tariff, here's my idea. And we, we've um, we've had really some good examples in the past six months uh, and even maybe a little bit more like a year, but of some suppliers that has, have, you know, very proactively communicated with us and said, hey, we, we see this issue. Here's what we would like to do. Um, here's what it helps. Here's where we need your help, <laughs> right? So in some cases, we might be on the hook to pay some of that cost, but at the end of the day, we get a better product, we get better delivery performance and a better cost performance. So, you know, if we if we have uh, that kind of open line of communication, like Darren said, uh, it really helps us out in that kind of mutual trust that, um, hey, we're, we're both trying to solve an issue here. Let's come together. Try to find issue here. A real partnership, uh, no matter what the, the the contract may say, or really a collaboration. The contract may say. Never. Dan, let's turn to you. Uh, tips for suppliers and OEMs? For unmuted OEMs. Who's this? Dan. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I lost the volume there for a second ago. Um, as far as tips, um. There's a, as people have mentioned with DART, there's a great deal of thinking and thinking and deep thought and strategic planning around um, company supply chains, manufacturer supply chains, and, and 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 what conclusions to draw from the recent shocks in the, in the system. We've talked about, you know, we've talked about interconnectivity. We've talked about uh, uh, other risks, but one of the things I want to highlight that. Uh, uh, that's been a concern of, of ours for a while that we deal with is around IP security. And the risk of IP security faced by too tight and too narrowly focused geographically the supply chain. Uh, China's been an issue around IP for years and haven't we haven't made the kind of progress we need to. 
And uh, when, you, when you're a manufacturer uh, with multiple, multiple facilities, certainly help you uh, minimize and put, it, put in uh, appropriate uh, tactics for managing IP protection. Uh, so I'd encourage as they're rethinking uh, their current situations to, to make that a priority in the part of the planning. Thank you, Wayne. A tip or two. Yeah, real quick. Again, a lot of suggestions that came out. They're all great. Again, the communication's big. The tracking is big going forward. All of those are, are definitely huge suge suggestions. Um, suggestions. Um, the, the other thing too is the shooting from the hip, and I and I know this has a lot to do with how many resources, how much resources any company really has, and how much the board is is sitting there beating all executives over the head, saying my costs are going up, fix it, change it. The first hip reaction is, let me just go grab another supplier. I'll worry about quality. I'll worry about tooling later. Make the change and see if I can save some money. Uh, at the end, it'll definitely be extremely costly doing all these things, and now and in the future, especially even with quality issues that may show up. All of these things are going to play into, you know, how effective they are, how cost effective they are, and the quality itself on all their supply chain as well, from tiers one, two, three, and down the line. Beyond tips for people. So unfortunately, uh, not to be a cliche here, but, uh, you know, we do live in inf interesting times. And it's clear to me here that auto chains, especially auto supply chains, pretty much any auto supply chain really is going to have to become increasingly resilient. I mean, I think that's the watchword here. You're going to have to be able to adapt. There are so many factors out there that can significantly alter uh, the, not only the political, but the business framework um, that that I think that one of the takeaways I would have is, is, is the, what I consider for the last decade has been considered um, you know, uh, wisdom of inventory being evil um, may actually need to start getting rethought of it. I think that it's going to become clear to me that companies really are going to need to take on significant volumes of safety stock and strategic inventory for particular items, just in case of uh, uh, you know uh, an event that 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 obviously they don't want to carry on their books. Low cost is always what you what you strive to do, but I think recognizing the uncertain environment that we are currently in. Um, that that is going to become more of a reality, uh, especially for the for the auto sector. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'll segue that into what what I think was going to be our next really topic, which was you know, what keeps me up at night. I mean, obviously the COVID nineteen thing is 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 is, is obviously the, the you know the huge topic out there, and it's something that concerns us and our families every day. Um, but you know, I posit to you this: what happens if the constant game of gamesmanship in the South China Seas accidentally turns into a shooting war between China and the United States? That'll throw everything up in the air. Um, and so, you know, those are the kind of you know dramatic supply chain shifts that if you don't have the necessary safety stock or inventory on hand, um, could really significantly hamper your operations. So maybe build safety stock. Well, we've got about five minutes left. We'll land quickly on the hour. And so I'll get to a couple of the questions for from the audience. One is this this $16 minimum wage isn't a hundred percent of the workforce. It's I think going moving up to 40%. But what does this mean? Do you have to buy software for this? Do you have to demand all wage information? And do you take it at face value when you get it from a supplier? Maybe that's for you, Darren, and, and Jan, you might add the thoughts. How do you how do you deal with this? <laughs> Well, some of that has still got to be cleared up, right, as far as the, the details. Uh, but I would assume, frankly, uh, that uh, the legislation is what it's, it's saying is what it's intended to say, which is that, um, you know, you, you need to meet that requirement. So you're going to have to have a level of documentation and auditability um, that uh, the, the, the you're actually meeting that $16 per hour, um, you know, content for that 40 percent and, you know, and going up. Um, the um, uh, and that uh, I think Marty indicated that as well. Some of that, you know, there, there, there's a period in here which uh, we don't have to provide it immediately, but you're going to have to be able to trace it back as well. And so, uh, if you think about it, um, it's going to require a lot of automation, frankly, to get, make that work properly, because otherwise, uh, it's going to be an enormous paperwork, literally paperwork nightmare, trying to pull all some all that together. Uh, but then once once you, the documentation is only one step, and that's probably from the legal side, Jan would say, right? So you got to have that. But now on the planning side, you got to be able to take the same thing and flip it over into how, how am I going to plan going forward as well? And so, uh, you know, so the ability to use something a lot more than Excel probably is going to be important to try and think about, you know, what are the, what do these costs look like? What do these projections look like? And so, um, it's a, uh, uh, 
you know, it, it, it's the, the intentions are good. The execution, the lawmakers don't typically think about. And then again, the execution is going to be a, a real hurdle to, to get in place effectively, especially, um, you know, the big guys will figure it out. They'll spend a lot of money to do it. Um, it's the tier two and three suppliers that are going to really struggle. And they're the ones that actually, that's the most vulnerable spot, frankly, and, and meeting that, the requirements of the legislation. Okay, Jan, anything quick, uh, quickly on this one? Uh I think the analogy that I would use in my practice here is conflict minerals. You had the exact same issue where you had certification being required in a visibility in your supply chain, which, quite frankly, you know, is pretty daunting to do. Um, so I think that my, my expertise, conflict minerals, shows me that, that, that this is a process that's going to evolve over the years. There probably likely is a business opportunity there for somebody to, 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 to generate a, a certification system um, to you know, vouch for these type of labor, uh, labor rates. I think at the end of the day, as long as the intention is to comply and you're, I mean, there's no, there is no pattern on here's how you succeed it. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be having this discussion, but I think that having a common sense approach and, and, and a documentary approach to be able to go around about this in the short term is the best one can do. Very good. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So rather than take more questions, which we certainly have, I'll leave it open if you want to uh, if the audience would like to send an individual question to any of the panelists, you can do that through the chat box. But otherwise, I want to thank very much East West Associates, uh, uh, Wayne and Dan, and uh, its president, Alex Bryant, for uh, co-sponsoring this. Jan, thank you to Frost Brown Todd and, and your team. Uh, uh, Darren, thank you very much for Plant Moran to be part of this and to have you with us. And Marty, we can't thank you enough for being you're on the hot seat in this stuff, and I hope it was interesting to you. If so, then it was a Very successful much so. Thank webinar. You. And thank, thank you all you. for joining, and we'll see you next time. Take care.